Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 13 of Maker's Mic, a music maker's podcast presented by LR Bags. That's right, it's Unlucky episode 13, which reminds me of a joke by my all-time favorite comedian, Mitch Hedberg. My hotel doesn't have a 13th floor because of superstition, but come on, man. People on the 14th floor, you know what floor you're really on. (laughs) What room are you in? 1401. No, you're not. (laughs) Jump out the window, you will die earlier. Our unlucky 13th guest this episode is Patrick Sweeney. Patrick is a modern-day, down-and-out blues man, as well as a certifiable blues historian. And he can set some guitar strings on fire. Patrick grew up in northeastern Ohio, gigging around Canton and Kent. He also spent some time playing alongside a young, unknown kid named Dan Auerbach, before Dan started the Black Keys. Patrick has a new album called Ancient Noise, out May 11th, engineered and produced by Matt Ross Spang at legendary Sam Phillips Recording Studios in Memphis, Tennessee. So tell me about young Patrick Sweeney. Man, young Patrick Sweeney, I've, you know, I'm, uh, grew up uh, in Maslin, Ohio, and sort of, I guess, what you'd call sort of sort of suburban, you know, sort of post-industrial town, but not too, you know. Ge- geographically, not, where is? Um, like, it's about an hour south of Cleveland, Ohio, about oh, 50, okay. 50, 55 miles due south. Okay. It was right near um, a, a, town, a neighbor to a town called Canton, which was the county seat, and that was, you know, where the Pro Football Hall of Fame yeah, is, yeah. and, you know, it's a big, little bigger town, and, mm-hmm. um, uh, but it was all fairly, you know, uh, Midwestern kind of, you know, sprawly kind yeah. of things, but, you know, then an older, older and younger brother, uh, mom and dad, you know, uh, went to Catholic school, you yeah. know, we all, we all did. We were me too. all alder, alder boys. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Are you kidding me? No. That's I, great. I grew up in Lexington, actually. Oh, right on. Yeah. I know you were just up there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any good, uh, embarrassing altar boy stories? Ah, uh, man. You know, other than like, you know, I being like getting close to junior high, I made, I remember I made. Aaron Simonetti laugh when the bishop visited, you know, and totally just stone faced it, and he got he got in trouble for it. Yeah, uh, but that's you know, like not really, you know, like yeah. that's you know. I threw up on the altar. Oh once. man, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've definitely walked. I remember walking off when I was like, I'm gonna pass out. Like, that yeah, like in the, the incense or something when they burn that stuff. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's so thick up there. No, yeah, I think that's what happened kid, to me. I, you yeah, know, I you don't have any sort in. of tolerance to any of that. And You're just, just like, all of a sudden, man, my Fruit Loops just came up. Oh, and it was all over man. the carpet. Oh, <laughs> and I looked over at the other altar boy, and uh, I was just, he was just like, I don't know what, what I don't know what yeah, to do. I don't know what to do, I could man. Just, I could literally see, like, you know, everyone just going, Yeah, you just got to figure it out that you should leave. But the priest didn't, he didn't notice, because he was like up front. You know, and I was kind of in the back. Right. And then, um, so I just walked off and uh, went into the back. And my mom had seen that I had thrown up, so she came up. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, man. That was that was fun. So punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, tell, me about, tell me about how you got into, into music and, and, like, uh, some of your earliest influence. And, and maybe, like... Around the high school days, you know. Right. So well, I mean, um, my dad uh, is, is into was is real into folk music and liked Pete Seeger and that kind of stuff and yeah. liked Lead Belly and and uh, he you know he had the first few Bob Dylan albums in his collection and he had all this cool like like sort of folk revival like that and he had some of the bluesier guys in his collection like John Hammond and and. Uh, you know, but he was also a huge like Kingston Trio fan. You yeah. know, well, he never returned. Eh? You know, <laughs> but that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you know, I thought that was so cool. You know, you could like play and sing. You know, because it wasn't any other like musicians around that I knew or that lived in our neighborhood. Right. Like that, and even through high school, you know, I didn't really know any dudes. That were you like, Were you playing music at that time or? Around 11 or 12, my dad was playing in the folk group at, at church, and then him and his okay. buddy. Uh, would hang afterwards and play, you know, 
play songs and right. stuff, and I would tag along. You know, I was just a kid, so I'd tag yeah. along. I thought that was cool. But then, you know, my brothers weren't into it, so they'd stay home. But I was, you know, I was like, yeah, I'll go. I'll yeah. go hang and, you know, and, like, played, like, This Land is Your Land for the first time in front of people, like, while they were hanging out. Yeah. And, uh, but it was, you know, so that was it. So I just thought, you know, it was probably around 11 or 12 or something like that. So I asked my I said, do you think I could do that? I could try that, you know, and. But I always just always responded to music so, so much. So, and then, so yeah, I was real into that. My dad, you know, showed me how to play, like he's a finger style player. So, okay. play freight train and railroad bill and all this early folk stuff, like your folk primer that you would have, like, you know, if you were in college in 62. Yeah. You know, it was completely disconnected <laughs> from the, like, the world around, like, you know, the, and I mean, I was, you know, I thought, None of you your, know Metallica it, was cool yeah, when I it wasn't started hearing the stuff that. Stuff your friends were listening to. Oh, absolutely not. Yeah. Just completely, just uh-huh. this other thing. Yeah, you know, and uh, and these folk records like uh, Ian and Sylvia, which are just beautiful, beautiful records. But I mean, were by far not hip at all. But they had really great, and like even like the early Gordon Lightfoot stuff. Like uh-huh. my dad, you know, my dad has a really killer version of Early Morning Rain and Drop D, and that's how I learned how to play in Drop D and started using. Other tunings, Alternate you know, tunings, my dad showed me yeah. how to play Tom Rush songs, so then that would take me to, you know, to to like blues stuff he covered, and, and albums were cheap then, you yeah. know, and, uh, you know, my, uh, the family business is, a, is a, a public golf course, so my parents took that over from uh, my grandparents, uh, and the place was almost, you know, like bankrupt, you know, like, yeah. yeah, we had one working tractor. So it was, you know, it may not like when you say it's a golf, but like it's, it was a really blue collar yeah. kind of uh-huh. thing. So do you play golf? Uh, no, I'm terrible. <laughs> terrible. I've got some clubs. But I'm, you know, uh-huh. I try every once in a while and I'm, you know, I don't care, you know, I'm, I'm not a, and that way I'm out there just to relax and, you know, yeah. be out there and, you know, just, I don't want, I don't care if I'm terrible, you right. know, so yeah. and that's sort of you just go out and very anti-golf. And yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. So I had this great, you know, kind of yeah the, life, you know, social life uh-huh. at that point of where, you know, I was meeting people that were, you know, older than me and different, you know. And yeah, and all kinds of different, people in the yeah, golf course. exactly. Yeah. And, and dudes you'd work with, you know, why is a dude working on especially those, on a uh, golf course for seven, you know, yeah. seven dollars an hour, especially at age those, 35, those like blue you're like color golf courses, totally, you know, totally, yeah. or guys that just do seasonal work, like that kind of thing. And then, but also having, you know, that's my parents' business of being like, you know, if you're slacking. You're stealing, yeah, and you're stealing from your family. Oh, right, like that to yeah. being like that sort of. So thing it kind of, like, of. So if you're doing a job, gave do you it, a really strong do work it. ethic, right? You know, I'm not, I mean, lazy teenagerish, you know, notwithstanding, yeah, but you know, still, but like also, you, yeah, but like somewhat responsible, right, yeah. right. But it's also, yeah. you know, like you know, it just it was just a really strange, like seeing drunk people. Yeah. Like that yeah, guy, yeah. a guy just uh-huh. hammered drunk in the middle of the afternoon, right. having a blast. Yeah. You know, playing like golf. That, playing golf, yeah. like him and his friends yelling and talking and stuff like that. And, you know, yeah. why they didn't, you know, like being a kid, like, why didn't they act like that when they walked in here? Why, right. You know, and that sort of thing. And then <laughs> also guys who, you know, and, yeah, and they guys came, being able they came to be responsible. And then yeah, by yeah. the time they left, they were, you like, know, and I'm handing them ice down tip. six packs at, you know, at, <laughs> 10 30 in the morning like yeah. here you go <laughs> <laughs> did uh, uh did you have a high school band i didn't i you know i played guitar with this other kid chad marsh who was you know about a year younger than me that i knew that played guitar and he mm-hmm. was into like eric clapton and eric clapton unplugged came out and i'm like okay yeah. cool people know this sort of bluesy folky kind of right, thing that i'm right. into All this of is a stuff sudden it's in the mainstream like, yeah it's a good song yeah. you know so like that so there was that was man that was a big bridge for me yeah you know yeah. and i you know and i was I was into like some like I wasn't really really into electric guitars. I mean, I I liked them. I loved I loved Led Zeppelin at that point. Yeah, you know I, uh, uh, you know I was really into that. I was then through that I started getting into BB King and Ray Charles and you know, uh, and you know from my dad's rock records when he was a kid. You know I had you know like Fats Domino. I know I loved Fats Domino. It was and 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 Buddy Holly and things like that. Yeah, and. Uh, Conversely, my mom uh, was born in Liverpool, England, 
and uh, and moved and moved to America in, in I think nineteen sixty. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, you know, same age as McCartney, and and you know, saw the Beatles at the Cavern. Didn't yeah. like the Cavern though, because it was like a close, you know, kind of gross place, and they're you know, young girls that just want to. You know, drink rum and cokes and dance. Uh-huh. You know, with right. cute boys, and they're just sort of like it was sort of seedy, so they didn't didn't dig it. Yeah. Like you know, yeah. So, and my impression of the Beatles, you know, my dad had a few of the few, first couple Beatles albums, and uh, my mom's family was the first thing I remember hearing about the Beatles. You know, they got famous is because his, you know, Brian Epstein's family owned all the record stores in London. <laughs> so immediately, like that whole like. Like that's my first impression of like a huge what I it thinks to be a very popular thing. Yeah, I'm just like, oh yeah, okay. So, and then they got into drugs, and you know that was <laughs> yeah. it. You know yeah. this is all, you know, uh-huh. very very Catholic mom. So I was just like, oh, all right, yeah, this must be bullshit. <laughs> like, and I yeah. miss. I mean, like I, you know, I'm glad that I didn't. I don't really have that that sort of DNA connection, you know, cause it pushed okay. me to get other things. But now I realize I, I do miss a lot of music and I used to discount them so much. I mean, I still like, I mean, like when people go Beatles stones, I'm like stones, yeah, you know, always. Yeah. But you know, cause they brought it to Lincoln, Nebraska. See, that's, that's, it's more the work ethic kind of thing. Yeah. And, and everyone argues, well, the Beatles can't do this. And I've just turned this into a Beatles stone podcast. So, <laughs> but it's, like, it's, I just liked it that the stones just did it because it's it's kind of refreshing yeah. though for for you to because I'm I'm just I've never been a big Beatles guy and I don't know what it is I just I'm just not yeah I I, I mean I, I I understand you know the relevance and and the greatness and I and I see all that but it's just not my thing right you know and and so everyone that I've had on this podcast. You know, eventually I'll ask, like, name some of your deserted island out, or give me mm-hmm. some of your f- greatest albums, greatest influence. Everyone always says the Beatles. I don't know. I mean, unpopular opinion. If you're really successful at the beginning and you have good management, it's really not that hard to make good records. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. Like, that's a thing we've is seen. And I realize there's, opinion? I'm not discounting their ability. You know, Paul McCartney is a genius, he's amazing, absolute yeah. savant. Yeah. You know, John Lennon, very yeah. creative. You George know, all Harrison, that band, just amazing. amazing. Yeah. And all that. But it's like, it's also like, you know, they're a special, they were a special phenomenon. They were a special thing, but there were these other things acting upon it. But like, at that same time, I'm beginning to hear like Pete Seeger records with him singing to like Carnegie Hall and his entire auditoriums of people singing along with him on these old songs that yeah. seemed just so much more universal and emotionally moving and i'm thinking like that's amazing you know yeah. there's this one guy in a guitar and he's reached out to all those people right and now those people are participating in a thing and are moved you know by are moved by yeah. this thing uh-huh. and like that and then hearing doc watson for the first time oh, yeah. and you know it's like live at newport you know a cassette tape and i'm just yeah. like Wow. What is this? Yeah. What is this voice? Let yeah. alone the, like the guitar playing. So it just right. all that shit. Just ne- I mean, I always sort of you know took it as sort of like eh, you know that's what money sounds like. Yeah, you know that kind of uh-huh. thing. And you know, and I I mean, and I yeah. guess that's why when I found it like punk rock and and like you know really abrasive you know music sort of at first I thought was bullshit. You know, then I realized, man, this is you know seeing it live performed in that energy i'm just like yeah this, this is this is this right is speaking to people this right? is right you know yeah. and it was and i was you know there in, in college and you know i uh, graduated high school in 92 so you know that whole nirvana pearl jam yeah. you know break you know it was right there happening yeah. in college all the same time while i'm playing you know mississippi john hurt songs <laughs> and, right. and this stuff and starting to gig you know, in, in college going to, you know, playing at like coffee house, open mics and stuff. And, yeah. you know, they gave me a, a Monday night to, to do, yeah. you know, pretty early on. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. Like some of your first gigs and like, it was at, uh, it was walking distance to my dorm at this little cafe that was called Brady's cafe run by. This, where'd you go to, where'd you go? To I college? went to school. Oh, I'm sorry. I went to school at Kent state. Oh, okay. Ohio, yeah. Yeah. 
I went there. My dad had been taking me to the Kent State Folk Festival for years, and I was like, to see that's, other people. That's where the the ma- the massacre happened. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 The Neil the Young 70- song. Oh, Ohio. absolutely. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Every you know, May Fourth, nineteen seventy. Yeah. That's, uh, and uh, but my dad had been taking me to that festival for ever. It was a long running, strong folk festival uh, at the time, and uh, they had. There were they had these things called the workshops where it was all in the uh, it was free and in all the conference rooms of the uh, the student union they had all these like you know little mini concerts or little workshops and sure. a dance workshop yeah. like you know uh-huh. and then they would have like acoustic blues guys and I could see these cats that were from near there I just thought that was the most exciting thing and then me and my dad would jam and my dad uh, play would play wash tub bass too and. Uh, and so that was a really great social thing for us. You know, we'd have a lot of fun, go to these parties, and they're sort of, oh, did you see look at Sweeney, yeah. Sweeney Brothers over there, <laughs> you know, getting down on right. playing like like jug band music and stuff, which I really, really got into, and that was a big part of, of, of the forming thing. Then through that, I met, you know, and playing lots of just finding more country blues and, and things like that. But then I also sort of... Uh, uh, was start, I was doing a lot of solo gigs and really trying to do that and was really kind of making, by the time I was 21, was gigging, you know, three, four nights a week, uh-huh. going to school, you know, during and the these daytime. Are, these are, are, at this time, are you playing like originals or are you doing no it's all covers? blues covers all, okay. all that you know old yeah. old kind of kind of stuff you know like you know like furry lewis and fred mcdowell you know yeah. a lot of delta stuff you know some jimmy reed you know some elmore james okay. you know when i started uh-huh. plugging in the guitar a little bit but always playing solo when uh, did when did you start sort of writing your own songs and uh, well there would have been a probably i probably would have been playing like your own songs about 24 25 like oh, much okay. later yeah yeah so by the time i got out of out of college which took almost six years because <laughs> i think it took I was, me about seven yeah yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think i think yeah. i did an independent study so it was almost <laughs> almost seven like i i uh I was gigging, you know, five nights a week. You know, I had a couple residencies. There was lots of, you know, every everybody who made a bunch of money, you know, in the stock market bought a blues bar, right. you know, for two years, uh-huh. you know, and ran it into the ground. But, you know, there was a lot of work for me that want me to come out and play solo, playing blues and, you know, and doing my thing, you know, on a Wednesday where they couldn't, they want people to come in, but they don't have you know, the money for a bar. I'm like, yeah, yeah man, you know, hundred bucks. Right. Yeah. And they're like, well, some band would be 200, you know? <laughs> so, and then, you know, live in, you know, it's Northeast Ohio. So it's very cheap to live, you yeah. know? And uh-huh. I was, you know, and having expenses, you yeah. know? Yeah. So yeah, it was, I mean, it was a great school of really learning to play. And were you like assembling a band at that time? Or? No, I was. I was living by that time. I'd moved to Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Okay. And uh, I just on for house sitting for a friend. Yeah, I was gonna <laughs> ask. Him. And uh, yeah, and like, how do you end up in Eureka Springs, yeah, I was, Arkansas? It was uh, an older friend of my, you know, guitar teacher's um, needed somebody to watch. You know, his, and I mean, George, the guy who owned the house. It was his dad's house. And his dad had died at like 94 or something like that. And it's out in the woods in Arkansas, about, you know, 10 miles from this little town, Eureka Springs. He said, well, you know, we just need somebody there to watch it until it sells, you know, and take care of things and, mm-hmm. you know, feed the dog. I'm like, sure. Free rent? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can do this, you know. And I'm just like, you know, let's go adventuring, you know. Let's see what happens. It's like I don't have to pay rent. I've been saving money. I've been working a bunch. Yeah. Saving money, you know, to like do something. You know, I figure that's closer to the Mississippi Delta. It's closer to Memphis, you know. It was, yeah. You know, six out, 300 miles away from it, but it's still, you know. And I'm like, is there a college nearby? And they're like, yeah, there's a college about an hour away. It's the University of Arkansas. I was like, so all right, well, cool. cool. I, I could, could probably go gigs. work over there or yeah. something, you know. But this little town, I immediately fell in this little place called Chelsea's and uh, and then started doing um, – it was right. I moved there right there during their folk festival, and I'm just sort is of that, like a uh, guy hanging out in town with the guitar case. Chelsea like, Swing, is yeah, that, that's I wrote song? that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
check this out, you know, and it's, uh-huh. you know, there's cool. Uh-huh. I made 75 bucks. I'm like, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. uh-huh. <laughs> like this is awesome. Yeah. You know, and then they were like, oh man, you should, you know, you should. So I started hanging so out there and I met. kind of became a regular. I met my, I mean, it was, yeah, a place. I, I mean, I still play that place. You know, yeah. I met my wife in that place. Oh, like cool. my whole social circle at that time. I mean, I didn't know one other person in that town. It all stemmed from that one gig at Chelsea's. Yeah. Like it's, which was just beautiful, you know. Huh. But like, you know, one of my best friends was, you know, one of the bartenders. Some of my other best friends, another one of the bartenders, or like worked in the restaurant or like, and it was sort of our little social circle, and it was the place to gig. Tell me about, um, tell me about, like your your first record. Well, I wrote most of it when I was living in the apartment behind Chelsea's. Had a friend who, uh, who who would rent out the uh, Unitarian Church, and he said it's a pretty good sound room. I've got some mics, and we can just you know record some songs, you know. So I was starting to really write at that point and starting to make, you know, and I had, again, it was like I'd been there for about a year and a half and, you know, just doing Mm -hmm. the same thing, you know. And uh, so I did that, but I knew I was running out of dough uh, and I didn't really have enough. It was wintertime, so there's no tourist income. So I'm just like, yeah, you know, I had enough put back to make it to Ohio, like, go home, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, so I made this, you know, I sort of recorded these songs and listened. I'm like, oh, that's cool, you know, but like, they're, you know, they're just like demos. Songs. Kind yeah, of very, very, very demo ish kind of things. Uh-huh. And I thought, well, you know, that's cool. But, and uh, I had no p- idea what to do with them beyond that, I had no concept of what it would take to produce something like that. So I went, uh, I went with my friends, uh, down to Key West, and I'm like, cool, I'm going to go down there and hustle, get me some gigs, you know, there's some people down there, and, you know, do my thing, yeah. and, you know, very naively think, you know, it's also a seasonal business, and the season's already started, and there ain't no room for, you know. Newbies. Newbies, yeah. right. So I'm like, really struggling, you know. I mean, I'm like, I was there for, I think, 40 days, but like on, like, like on day like 32 or something like that, you know, I'm, I was trying to busk on the street and, you know, some drunk tourist just like, you know, bro, whatever like that. Yeah. Grabs a dot, like the $1 out of my, out of my uh, case uh-huh. on the street. He's like, can I have this man? You know, and I'm, you know, I've got my guitar on my chest and I reach over and I'm, you know, I grab this guy's wrist and, you know, and I'm shoving it, you know, shoving him away, trying to get my dog back. I'm thinking, I just stop. I'm yeah. like, what is my life? Yeah. Am I fighting? Am I about to fight this dude over a dollar? I'm like, I gotta get, the, yeah. <laughs> get out of here. Yeah. So made it back. Had enough. Again, I was smart. You know, uh, kept uh, enough money. To get kept home. enough money to get me from Key West back to Arkansas, where I had money to, to get, get from Arkansas to back to Ohio yeah. and then moved there in February of like, I think, what is it? 98 or 90 it would have been early 99 and just like oh, it was brutal brutal cold and broke you know what my brother was going to Kent State at the time I was staying in my younger brother's you know apartment on the floor sleeping on the floor a guy who owned a club I used to play had opened a new place and was doing live music and and he said hey man like, oh, good to see you and I'm like man I just moved back you know and I'm broke. And he's like, well, man, maybe come in stock beer and help clean up for a while. He knew, you know, he was like, he knew that, you know, I need, I was really stuck and mm-hmm. I needed some help. Yeah. So, you know, he just let me do that. Then I got, I was like, man, I, you know, he's like, man, you should put, you know, you should put something together and play Monday nights. I'm like, done. So I called up some of my old guys and, uh, and we started doing yeah. every Monday night and, uh, you know, there's nothing to do in Kent on a Monday night. Some people are like, oh, there's some, you know, shit happening. You know, it's a band playing. It's free, you know. Yeah. So it got to be a thing that people just came out on Monday nights to do, you know. And I, and it lasted a, a couple of years. That's cool. And uh, and that's when Dan Arbach's dad, Chuck, 
he'd been coming me come and see me play some acoustic gigs over in, in Akron where he lived at a little club called the North Side. So he'd come over and he's like, oh man, that's cool. Was we're playing Delta stuff and Elmore James and starting to mess with Hound Dog Taylor and and then some, you know, a little bit of soul stuff. And uh, I heard from Mike Lenz, uh, a great guitar player. He said, man, you got to see this kid that that I've, I've given a lesson to every once in a while. I said, well, man, yeah. I said, man, you should tell him to come out on Monday night. I said, yeah, I don't know if he's 21 yet. Like, so, <laughs> well, eventually he showed up and, you know, I, you know, Mike introduced me. I was like, man, you come in, you know, set in. And, you know, he had his Hound Dog Taylor Tysco guitar and, you know, he didn't know the names of the strings like that. I'm like, hey, man, hit, me, hit your D string. You know, your D string. <laughs> D string. Dang. <laughs> like, he just didn't. Yeah. He just sort of shrugged. I'm like, you don't know the names of the strings? He's like, no. And I'm like, all right. You know, that's that's, that's, kind of, that's, that's that's important. But, I mean, he could, oh, he could play. Yeah. He could play like, you know, he could play like a mother, man. You know, it was... You know, he just had natural ability, natural talent, you know. And uh, so we started playing together. I'm like, right on. This is fun. Dan and I played a party in Kent, you know, and we're just like, man, let's just do it, two guitars and drums. Mm -hmm. Like do the hound dog thing. See if we, and, it, and it worked. And we had fun. And we played for all night long. It was really, really fun. Yeah. And uh, so I'm just like, well, we're just going to do that. And that's really what, like... Then we started playing some of my original stuff. By then, I'd already recorded that that acoustic album. I uh -huh. recorded that in in Ohio in '99. It's like this would have been about 2000, 2001. So I started doing some of those songs. Uh, we started playing a little bit out of town shows. I'd go back into Eureka Springs and do their blues festival, um, uh, and we do a three night stand. We still still do it Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday at were Chelsea's. Guys, were you guys playing electric? Guitars? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All, electric, oh yeah, yeah. two electric uh -huh. guitars and drums. Okay. And Dan would handle the the bass end of it, and I'd play lead. Okay. And then occasionally, parlor show, we'd switch or like, yeah. you know, I know we were screwing around sometimes of like me playing the, you know, the low notes and playing the high notes and like that kind of thing on the same guitar. And, right. But it was a, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And then uh, we were playing a bar gig in Dover, Ohio, at Rascal Saloon, and we were on the break. He's like, hey, man, I did this recording with this, this friend of mine. You got to hear this shit. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, well, what is it? He's like, man, it's like Wu-Tang Beats with, like, T-Model <laughs> Ford. And uh, I was like, oh, man, listen, I'm like, I mean, some of it was a little raw at the time to my yeah. ears. I'm just like, but I was like, man, that's that's cool. I said, well, man, we'll just be cool about training your replacement. I'm running a business here, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like that. And just had a chuckle, but like it wasn't, you know, they got their deal and they were, you know, I mean, were you out on the, out on the road? Like when you heard, did you have any clue beforehand that he was kind of like going to go yeah. and do his oh, own? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. Yeah. And that always, I mean, I mean, he was always focused on doing his own thing. But it seems like thing. all the guys you've always played with are like, you know, Jumping around and yeah. playing with other musicians. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what a you know, it's what what's what they do. It's the hustle, right? you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm you know, I'm, I, and I'm also you know very you know realistic about it. Like Patrick Sweeney music, probably you know, it can't quite support <laughs> more than one household. Yeah, you know, or at least half of my household, really. You know, um, uh, if you, if this is your only thing at this point in the business, you know, right. so it's like. But I definitely want, you know, people to be motivated and things like that, you know, to and 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 I feel like I've got, you know, through my experiences and through the way I've done things, I've you know, I've got some some pretty solid things to to you know, to show oh, show people. For sure. And you know, and you know, the blues thing that I've responded so much to has always been about sharing it and passing it along. Yeah. And you know, yeah. And it's sometimes that's that's also, you know, emotional for me. It's a little tough, you know, when a dude leaves or leaves in the lurch, you know, you're like, Man, you know, I'm really Yeah, you know, like I'm we giving had a you a lot of, I'm giving you a lot of what's inside, you know. So I mean, sure. but that's just, you know, but that's any any relationship, I guess, just human yeah. nature. Yeah. But like but it's always, you know, cats that are like I know that they learn things. And yeah. a lot of times they'll tell me that they're like, Man, you know, the way of just yeah, but handling it. Also, you know? like you guys, I mean, 
it, he didn't exactly just fly the coop. Like he, he no, I mean, and he always had his own and like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, we produced on, a rec, produced yeah. and engineered a record. Uh-huh. I mean, basically the record that's given me my, you know, this the yeah. second half of my career. Yeah. But uh, but Dan has always had his own band. He had a band called the Barn Burns, the same drummer and a different ba- you know different bass player. Oh okay. Simultaneously, like mm-hmm. you know, his dad Chuck was like, "Well, if you're not going to school, you better be working." And you know, but uh, that was, you know, that was a thing. And then seeing the the you know the success of the Keys mm-hmm. and and doing that of being like trying to reach and realizing like, man, that's you know. And Dan was always just like, "Man, you should." should only be playing it because i was still gigging a lot and he's like you should only be playing your own songs yeah and i'm like man that's that's cool but we lead different lives yeah you know right. like that like i'm playing 10 to 2 uh-huh. you know yeah yeah You're doing yeah. little gigs here but they don't yeah. pay money and those don't pay band guys yeah just from a but he was a, always a, very supportive of like Oh yeah, to encourage you. And- yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, also like that. Dan was never very a, a very social person ever, mm-hmm. and you know, to that. So like, unless you were sort of in his orbit anyway, like he, yeah. it was just sort of them. Sure. You know, he's always been a guy who wakes up early and goes to the studio and does that thing, and then just psh, yeah. Like even okay. his band lights are like, man, you want to go get a beer or something like that? Nah. No, <laughs> no, it's gonna you know just yeah. do his thing. So that was like, yeah, so it was cool. I mean, like, like, you know, and we opened a couple shows, things like that, you know, Mm -hmm. like that after the, uh, you know, and he'd done, and then, then he produced and engineered that record and, uh, you know, we thought we were on our way, but then, you know, like just nothing happened. I mean, I was on a, you know, I'd I'd been gone working with Nine Mile Records with Rick Pyrrhic, Mm -hmm. which was amazing, but, you know, anything I was trying wasn't working. Like as far as like furthering the business, I'm yeah, like, yeah. And then Rick came along, and was Taking like, "Hey, what do you want to do? Not what have you already done?" Right. And that that relationship is, you know, definitely the reason I have a career because cool. he was the one that took an interest in me, like, I was like produced by a black key. Yeah, you got it. But he was also like very pragmatic about like, yeah. what does it take? What are you Make doing? You like, what? Well, that also is like, can you? can you do these things? You know, I'm a label. I can help you get an agent. You know, yeah. we seem to, I can be the guy. So right. it's not just you so pretending to be like someone running else. in your own business. Right. Yeah. And, and like, and that's the thing. It's like, he said, cause you know, I just was failing yeah. at it. I'm like, I can't go any farther. It's impossible to, to do. I mean, yeah. I know some artists who, you know, do all their own booking and like, it's, how, how it's do you, a, how? I think to, to really progress is very, I mean, it's far, I mean, people do it. I just never, I yeah. never could, Yeah. you know, and that's, you know, and I really, I mean, I really, I really tried. Yeah. <laughs> you I, know. Um, there's a, there's a video interview of you online and you're talking about them shoes kind of getting caught up in the Pandora and Spotify yeah. algorithm and getting on these like black keys and white stripes playlist and, and that kind of helping you grow an audience. I mean, it's it's solely responsible that I have an audience at this point in my career, yeah, which is much larger than it's ever been before. And so I mean, that was very helpful, extremely helpful. What uh, I mean, I don't want to get into the whole debate of like, you know, m- streaming music and and mm-hmm. you know. I mean, I'm I'm happy to chime in on 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 how it is. Well, I think, yeah, I, I mean, think it's been helpful for you, right? I mean, it's been it's been. But the exposure it, has been like Pandora. I think they're they pay a reasonable rate, and I think that's that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Spotify, I just think is just they're not distributing the wealth. They they feel like that the you know the music they use is is just sort of secondary Public domain, to the, yeah, to the product. They're not honoring yeah. copyright law. They're not doing it. It's like I'm. I mean, it's tax time. I made less money this year, even though we have thousands and thousands and thousands of more fans right but a demonstrably of, of of what album sales and physical sales and download sales have declined but streaming audiences and streaming numbers have gone up yeah so if you can't if you you know it's just not a sustainable thing yeah. and they're 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 playing the long game they're just trying to keep it out of legislation for as long as they can uh-huh. they're making piles of money they don't disclose you know 
what they make from advertising. They don't disclose. They have, you know, they've they've got it just murky enough. Yeah. Yeah. And to keep it tied up that they don't have to do it. But that, you know, it's it's interesting. Yeah, it's it's not they don't care. For you know for a musician like yourself, like where does the where's the bulk of your income come from? Touring and playing shows and gigging? A good, a good yeah, a good I would say about really about I don't know, I would guess gigging is probably about 50 to 60 percent of it and then and you know from you know album sales album and sales. downloads uh and you know and, and and streaming revenue is you know is the other okay. is the other part let's uh let's talk a little bit about ancient noise man yeah very very so excited about for, this for our listeners this is your newest album about right. to be released Maybe before this episode, maybe after this episode is released. Right. Who knows? The official um, release date is May 11th. May 11th, so. 2018. Uh, yeah, tell me about the record. What What's the story behind it? And So for a long time, I'd been trying to work with Matt Ross Spang, who we <laughs> met taping a, a, a Sun session. He was the engineer at Sun Records. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, he would... Uh, they would do sessions at like it was you know it's a museum during the day and then afterwards they would do sessions right do so sessions like they at, do tours and all that kind of stuff right. during the day but then, and, but then can, at night at night you can like after five or six or something you right can, you can load in and, and start prepping your session and, yeah. and recording but then you got to break it all down yeah in the morning so which is just amazing that you know that people can work that way but you know to record in that room well matt uh I'd been hearing about him um, a lot because he had started to hearing about what he'd done at Sun of like re getting some of the old equipment. Back yeah, I read about him like a little that. bit too. He, he got a bunch of the original gear, like and a young then. cat too. Like yeah. he started working there when he was sixteen, you know, uh-huh. and he's starting to engineer sessions at you know right out of high school, like right. crazy. Yeah, you know, but also, you know, meeting Sam Phillips and things like that. You know, being very, very perceptive and very studious about what was going on and what makes this thing special yeah so again being with it in that position and yeah then and the now Phillips he's doing stuff with scene. like dave cobb and and right yeah yeah and it's just like he's and margo worked, and yeah and he recorded that margo album at yeah. sun you know that uh-huh. and uh we did this session and you know like i didn't realize matt was the same guy i'd been kind of hearing about at the time and i sort of figured it out later it was uh but we walked in and we're like, and I, you know, we're loading in and, and we're real nervous. It's the first, you know, it's one of the first nights of a, of a string of like three week dates or something like that. You know, yeah. we've got a Memphis show the next night. Um, uh, so we're loading in and we're just, you know, we're playing through these real tweed deluxes and, you know, all the, the stuff. And I'm looking at the, you know, there's these old, you know, the old preamps and all that stuff. I'm like, dude. I really just thought this was just going to be a taping. We'd be tracking to like Pro Tools. Like, what's going on? <laughs> and Matt's like, "Oh yeah, you know, sort of. Hey, this is you know. No, this is. And how we I so do we it. started gear geeking, and I'm just like, ooh, which made me super nervous. <laughs> I'm like, this is real. Yeah. And then we, you know, we're set up. We're real efficient. And everything like that. And I'm like, yeah. Man, would it be cool if we went and got some beer? Just had a, a beer to kind of. Yeah. cool out i said i mean i'm just super duper nervous we're not going to be you know disrespectful but like he's like yeah man he's like you do whatever you want this is your session and i'm like oh thank you so we yeah, we run to the gas station just all the whole band is just out there and just like oh my god you know the birthplace of rock and roll yeah. it's like just we're all really nervous like i don't really get nervous for gigs very much you know every once in a while but we're just like <gasps> <laughs> okay okay yeah. just relax just do our thing just do our thing right you know the thing and yeah. then you know and and then matt was into the songs and, and 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 stuff and so we you know we just sort of kept in communication like yeah you gotta come down here and do an ep and i'm also thinking man it'd be cool to do an album you know mm-hmm. and uh it came time to do a record and uh you know we did it uh at joe mcmahon's place and you know it really really liked how that thing but i was thinking the next one we've done three national albums i'm like so i called up matt and i then matt had started you know working with dave cobb and had been 
you're seeing some success. I'm like, man, I yeah. better, better call soon. <laughs> He's like, hey, man, you got to come down. I've been working at Phillips Recording. Yeah. You got to come check this place out. That studio is so beautiful. It's yeah. amazing. You know, it's perfect. Every, every, every light bulb, every placement is Sam's design. And it's like, you know, it's a magical, magical, incredibly comfortable place to do it to make a record and to perform. And, and uh, so we talked to Matt about doing, you know, doing a real record. And yeah. like, you know, I let the producer choose the team usually. And he's like, well, you know, it's sort of kind of see what kind of record it is. And, you know, and this is the first time I'd ever let a producer have demos or anything like yeah. that. And because uh, I wanted to be collaborative. I wanted to be like, you know, I've sort of, you know, trust Matt. And I trust where he, where he thinks it should go. And like, these are the songs. And, and, uh, so he's like, well, until I hear the songs, I don't really know who's on the team. And I'm like, and I'm writing the songs, you know, right up to and including the session. Yeah. But we decided about, you know, like about six weeks out, he's like, man, you know, I think Ken Coomer, I just did a record with Ken Coomer. Yeah. And he said, he's your guy. I'm like, okay, cool. And he said, and I think we're going to get Charles Hodges to play keys on it from, you know, the Al Green, High Records, all that. And he cool. said, do you got a funky bass player? Or, should, you know, and I'm like, he's like, I think you need someone from your team. I'm like, let me, you know, call Ted, Ted Pecchio, who uh, played baritone guitar in the band for a, for a year or two. Uh -huh. And, uh, uh, and Were like, you when you so, guys and he's my brother, so we, you know, we and he's just so funky, yeah, yeah. So, so it was nice to have someone that you were very familiar right. with, and I'd met Ken a couple of like socially, mm -hmm. and uh, but like I didn't, you know, I didn't know him, and you know, other than like you know, that one Wilco record, I really didn't know his playing. I just thought, man, is he sort of a rock guy? And then Matt's like, no, he's greasy, man, like it's and the greasiest yeah you know yeah, he's cool. man just insanely greasy which you know so we made this like really you know there's an overlaying like real funk to this thing you yeah. know of like a real groove based record but you know it's kind of nice did he have you guys kind of set up all in the same room or just... yeah i had um uh he had yeah uh ted the bass amp at one at one end of the live track room had drums sort of um back center mm -hmm. of uh, uh of uh of the tracking room and then had charles uh over here on keys live yeah live off the floor but i was in the booth facing all them but the doors were open you know just so i could see but we could get you know yeah try to get vocal takes so there are some you know like right off the floor yeah vocal takes like i think baby every night is right off the floor okay like and that's yeah like second take just like and it was cool like charles like his contribution and it was like he was just one of the team mm -hmm. just and that but he had ideas he's like drummer sock symbol on that part and i'm gonna set up this bridge i'm like well yeah i mean like you know he's like he said just try it just try it we we'll roll it and then, and then you know, of course and he does it and it, it's amazing. perfect it's yeah. perfect yeah <laughs> and so we're just like you know, like freaking out because yeah. he's our hero too, you know, and just like, but he just made a track that was just sort of okay. He made it the track, you know, so right. that was it, you know, so we ran So it, it was a good collaborative It really was, effort. you know, it was really, there wasn't any sort of yeah. ego or anything attached to yeah. it. You know, Matt is excellent at, you know, at the psychology of it, if something's working, but it was so relaxed and so easy. Things worked really, really fast. We ended a day early. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't which, hear about that. You don't very hear often. about that at all. Ever. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. You know, like we're done. That's, you know, those yeah. are the eleven songs, guys. Is That's that it? it. That's it. Cool. I got I got nothing else. Yeah. Like you want to cut a cover? No. <laughs> no. You know. Right. Cool. We did eventually go back I did go back and record old time ways, but use the same team, you know, mm -hmm. Ken Matt in there and uh because we needed an up tempo one, you know, yeah. but I just didn't have that song. Tell me. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about the album. Like, what's it, what's it all about? Ain't well, I like I like ancient, the name. Yeah, ancient noise. Well, it's mm -hmm. it's sort of I take that from from a, a Devo song, Ohio okay. represents, <laughs> um, uh, uh, from Gates of Steel. Uh, give in to nature, ancient noise. Take a chance on a brand new dance. Okay, you know? yeah. and uh, 
twist away the gates of steel. Like I love that line of just those using an old form, you know, this, uh, but making it a new thing, which essentially is all rock and roll is. Yeah. And, and uh, that's all you've ever done. That's all like. I've ever done. You know, it's <laughs> like try to, you know, make this thing, you know, new from using these old sounds, these, you know, almost archaic languages. You know, like I play finger style guitar. It's not, you know, a really modern type of way of playing, but yeah. it's got this thing that I like and I respond to. I've, you know, I've always been fascinated by that. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of just that sentiment on on the record. So that 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 definitely is like sort of the overriding theme okay. of of that. But of course Mark Mothersbaugh said it best, you know, <laughs> ancient noise. I wish yeah. it was my my quote, but but I do love me some Devo. Cool, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Dude, um uh you have any jokes? Do I have any jokes? Man. I know. I, I, don't mean I heard a really up. dark one, like there. It's not dirty, but it's it's dark from uh, from Jeremy Pinnell the other the other day. And man, that one really got me. It's like guy walks into a bar, stays there my entire childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that like, dark. yeah, that, yeah, that was that's dark. I'm trying to think of what. Uh, <laughs> That's a great one, though. We we can we can roll with that one. Okay, I'm good. Gonna keep, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I don't really have on. much more yeah. much yeah. more than that. Uh, give me a few of your deserted island albums. Man, I guess definitely Bobby Bland's Two Steps from the Blues, which okay. I mean, I guess is a collection of singles, but it's definitely the way they ordered it and the way it's so good. I'm I'm just, not much of a blues historian, and I, I yeah. gotta admit, like. Probably about ninety percent of the names that you've thrown out in this <laughs> interview, I am not familiar with. Oh, cool! Yeah, um, Bobby so, Blue Bland so is knew, the way. I knew the way knew and the truth. Be, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Like he's like he's been in. He was a contemporary of Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, Solomon Burke, like. All those, those great yeah. are and like you know little Willie John like James Brown like all of the those great era like famous flames era James Brown like all on the road at the same time and they all said Bobby had the best band so Bobby Bland's Two yeah. Steps from the Blues Desert Island Disc ah uh, I mean for straight I mean you need you need rock and roll tough call either Sticky Fingers or Exile. Man, that's tough. That's that tough. tough. That is tough. I think I'd take Sticky Fingers. Which one's got, fingers. yeah, it's, it's, that, that's got sway on it, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, then yeah, say Sticky, I mean, because, yeah. you know, you can kind of get, you know, I realize one had to come before the other, but yeah, okay, so Stones, oh, and, uh, rolling, uh, the Rolling uh, Stones quotient will be filled by uh, Sticky Fingers. Uh, flowers on my grave. Dead flowers. Oh, yeah, Don't Dead Flowers. Me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, very partial to that song, too, because he mentions yeah. Kentucky Derby Day. So yeah. You know. <laughs> we played that one on the gig in, in Lexington. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah cool. man, God. <laughs> Did you guys go to Keeneland? Yeah. It was awesome. Isn't that beautiful? I've never seen anything like that in it's my amazing. life. It's yeah. amazing. Amazing. I used to skip the high school set. and go there. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, give me a... Give me, Give me a band that you listen to that might surprise people. I mean, I guess you could throw Devo on there, probably. Yeah, people Devo. Probably wouldn't. Um, man, a band. I don't know. I like Slayer quite a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I do. Yeah, I've seen, uh, yeah, I'm always up for you know Rain and Blood. Uh -huh. That's you know. Yeah. So I guess that's probably the one that people would not get. Yeah. You yeah. Know? You mentioned Metallica earlier. So oh yeah. I mean, I was into like when they came metal. out. Like I was really into like Master yeah. of Puppets. Yeah. And Hide the Lightning. Ride like the all lightning. the pre-Black uh -huh. album stuff. Right. Like you know. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Ride the Lightning is awesome. Kill them all. Kill them all. Yeah. You know, Motor Breath. That's yeah. on there. Yeah, man. You know. Is there a movie or a TV show that you've been thinking about lately? Doesn't even have to be the last thing you've seen. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, uh, The Simpsons is all. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> it is all. It's my religion. It is uh -huh. my is my everything. Uh, but uh, did some. Uh, I'm watching a show called Seven Seconds 
right now on Netflix. That's that's pretty. I mean, it's heavy kind of crime drama. Okay. Like me and the me and the wife. That's our that's our little like our time together. Well, you know, we we definitely get some you know crime drama time in. You yeah. Know, when we want, you know. Yeah. My wife you know, and I are the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We Seven get, seconds. Know, yeah, it's, it's pretty, on Netflix. Pretty good. Yeah, okay. It's heavy, man. It's like you know, it's not. Have you, you know. seen or heard of Flint Town? I just saw it on the thing. I haven't. I haven't. I, I've, Dude, I've, yeah. You gotta watch that. It's is it really cool? My, yeah, it's a documentary, so it's all. But it, I mean, it's film. It's so cinematic and just beautifully shot and cool the story. Um, it's, yeah, it's so intense. Wow, you should check it out. I will. Flint I definitely Town. will. Yeah, cool. Dude, let's hear a jam. Okay, let me get my guitar. Yeah. Rolling, so... Uh, okay. All right, you're good. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to rock. Okay. Tell us, uh, tell us what, what you're about to play. I'm going to play a song, the last song on Ancient Noise, called Victory Laps. Victory Laps. <laughs> yeah. Like a broke man Lottery, like a hobo wishing on stars, like a barfly's big spending fantasy, like a fairy tale told in bars. Taking victory laps, taking victory laps, taking victory laps. Taking victory laps A child Staring at posters Posters never look like me I was a child My mama said Don't ever, ever trust the TV Lord, I never believed in the glamour Wish somebody else would could drive Wish I could lay back And try to relax But I'm a real man All my life Taking victory laps Taking victory laps Taking victory laps Taking victory laps Most of my life is getting there Never get to hang out long Folks down the road want the best of you Giving them less is wrong a show I didn't drive to till her I turned to stone never rode a bus unless I haunt somebody's stuff might never do it on my own the money they say will change you I'd like to see some changes made live miserable and comfort cry with all my bills paid take a victory lamp take a victory lamp take a All right, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. All right, we'd like to thank our guest, Patrick Sweeney. 
To find out more about Patrick, be sure to check out patricksweeney.com and order your copy of Ancient Noise and just go buy all his albums. Also, we filmed an Americana video session with Patrick, which you can find on the LR Bags YouTube channel. So be sure to check those out. Thanks so much for listening, and please like, subscribe, and share, and we'll catch you next time on Maker's Mike.